it's great to meet with you all. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you. We, what's going to happen, I suppose, over the next 45 minutes or so, um, I'm going to obviously explain the project, uh, explain, you know, the structure of it, the methodology of it, how, how it's working, but also, I suppose, try and g give some sense of what we've found to date. Now, the first thing I'd say is we're still early enough in the project. Um, so this, the, I suppose, the purpose of this presentation is, is to let people know um, primarily about the project and encourage anybody across Westmead or, or people who might have material relating to Westmead uh, to get in contact and to, to let us know about the material that you might have. So I'll, I'll talk through all of that. But before I do that, I suppose I want to just talk briefly about the, the overall value of oral history. And, you know, again, I know some of you um, from, from, from other projects, etc. And I know that you you know the value of it and you appreciate it. And I have felt since I was very, very young that um, there's a tremendous natural uh, value to the memories, particularly of older people. And throughout my life, I think that has increased because we've seen so much change in Irish society that the memories of older people um, can connect us to, to experiences, to times, to um, knowledge that, you know, we, we don't have access to anymore and it, it becomes more and more important to to um to document that therefore but what we're talking about today i suppose is identifying what has been collected previously because there's one thing recording the memory and that is the natural impulse i'll talk more about this throughout the presentation but there is that natural desire to record and that's been there for a long long time you know, uh, both at a national level and then particularly where, where I'm interested at a local level by individuals and groups who've gone out there to record. And, uh, you know, I know it myself, you become consumed by the desire to, to, to record what will be lost. And that is the most glorious sort of impulse of all and it's the, the most purest impulse in relation to oral history. But where we've kind of fallen down a little bit is that we haven't been able often to follow through from that recording to, you know, firstly, preservation for the future, and then secondly, opening that out to the public. And there, they are fairly big steps, you know, um, and like I'm involved in projects that are really, really good at following those steps and, and you know, finishing that, uh, that circle. Um, but sometimes, and it's through no fault of, of any individual or group, that just can't happen. And as a consequence, then I've seen many, many times you, collections, incredibly valuable, you know, indescribably valuable collections will end up um, in an attic, they'll end up in a shelf, they'll end up in a box. And that's fine if they can be eventually retrieved. But I've seen examples, uh, which I'll talk about in the presentation, that went too far. And, you know, dozens and sometimes hundreds of tapes and recordings will be lost because they will degrade or they will um, be damaged in some other way. So I suppose in a broad, broad sense, uh, the project here is about identifying what has been collected, where it is, and much of it is very well preserved and much of it is, is, is you know, some of it is even accessible, but in some cases it may not be. And uh, so this project will hopefully at the end of it tell us very broadly what is out there in Westmead, what has been recorded, where is it currently, what kind of condition it's in, etc. So um, I, I'll very much welcome questions, as Melanie said, towards the end and um, any comments. But of course, afterwards, then I'll be encouraging everybody to get in contact if they've got uh, relevant information. So I'll share the screen. I have my sound ready to go and we'll get the presentation up. Right. OK. Now. So um, I, I've given a broad sense of the uh, of the the purpose of the project, but just to kind of again ensure that we're all very very clear about it, um, I'm going to read the mission statement that both uh, Melanie and I um, created uh, at the start of the project. Now, just before I go any further, can I just maybe check with Melanie there if you want to unmute yourself that we're seeing that and everything is okay.
Melanie, can you come in there and just give me an indication? I can't I see you at the minute. Just unmute yourself and let me know that we're we're um we're all okay. Your mute is on, I think there, Melanie. But even a thumbs up, will you were able to see that, yeah? Good enough, good enough. That's fine. We'll go back to it again. So right. Uh, okay, the mission statement uh, for the project uh, is as follows. The Westmead Audit of Oral Heritage Collections aims to deliver for the first time a comprehensive and data-rich listing of all known collections of memory, oral history and folklore in or about County Westmead, collected over many decades. Its central focus will be to document what has been recorded, both at private and individual levels, as well as regionally and nationally, and to recognise the work of many collectors without whom this memory would be lost. The output will include a wide-ranging database, as well as contextual, historical and cultural descriptions of identified collections. OK, so that, that broadly explains what we're about. Um, before I go into the background of this particular project, I want to explain as well that the first such countywide um, audit for, of oral heritage collections took place in 2017 up in County Donegal. And I was lucky enough to be commissioned to, to take on that project. Um, and it was a challenge, you know, both because of the size of, of County Donegal, of course, but also because it had not been undertaken before. So that project um, necessitated, I suppose, the creation of a methodology of how you go about uh, identifying the collections of oral history and how you go about, you know, chronicling those and what are the aspects you want to identify and what do you want to know about these collections uh, so as to put the county in a better position to understand what has been collected and, and where it is. Um, so that was a really, you know, it was a really exciting project and really interesting project. It, it was also challenging in the sense of just how, how to get that right. And I think we did quite well in Donegal. And again, I've been fortunate enough since to, to do uh, an audit across County Kilkenny as well, um, where again, the application of that methodology was in play, but also then, of course, we tried to adapt it and try to see what else we could do um, or what we could change to, to, to arrive at a better result for the county you're working in. And I've also been working in Cork um, over the last two years or so uh, on an audit down there. And now I'm very happy to be working with Melanie in County Westmeath. And again, I think it's important. Many of you obviously will know about Melanie's work, but in relation to oral history, she's been really, really positive as a heritage officer. And that's not to say all heritage officers aren't but at the same time, she's taken a leading role, both in terms of training and providing support to people um, like Nola Callahan and others that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a little while, but has been really positive with regard to oral history. So the um, audit is another example of that. So the audit, of course, is an action of the Westmead Heritage Plan. And again, there's thinking in that because it needs to go into the plan first uh, and then needs to be actioned by, by, by Melanie. It's supported by the Heritage Council and, of course, Creative Ireland as well. It's overseen by Melanie. And just importantly for all of us, the timeline of the project is, is, is um, ending in October. Now, you know, that is approaching approaching fast, um, but at the same time, there there is plenty of time there. We have a bit of progress made already, and you know the responses are very very positive. So that's the broader idea of the project. Just to to to, to maybe put a little bit of a um, a sense of where uh, the limitations. Um, uh, Somebody is just saying there to about the to, to enable a larger screen to better run the slideshow. It won't actually work, Geraldine, um, because when I put on the slideshow, it 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 obscures it. So we'll we'll have to manage hopefully from now on. But again, it's only an aid anyway. Um, I'll be talking through it. So, um. We're trying to restrict the audit to, to spoken recollections, so conversations, recordings of memory. Um. The, the typical type of thing you'll think of when you think of oral heritage, oral history, folklore, that idea of the, the recording of, um, of, of spoken recollections, of spoken uh, memory. Now, where there is a sort of um, a grey area is in the area of, of singing and music. 
it's not certainly the case that we're going to try and exclude exclude singing and music. But if it's just recordings of music, then it, it wouldn't really fall into the to the brief. But if it was recordings of musicians who would play music and then talk about the cultural context that it, of the tune or, or the people they learned it from, then that would qualify. And I suppose you have to have some limitation on a project in the same way with singing, where we have singing and where we have uh, some form of, of, of um, discussion around that, then that's very much valid as well. Um, and even today, I, 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 yesterday I was contacted by a lady in Westmead who has recordings from the 1960s uh, made by her, her grandmother of, of singing in, um, in in Westmead. So, you know, they're, they're there and they're massively uh, important. So it's not, this is a really important clarification for everybody. The project is not about physically taking in the collections of oral history. And that, that's a really important clarification because I know from other projects or from other counties that some people would perceive it to be that we're looking to take the material in. Now, it doesn't mean that Westmead County Libraries won't be delighted if people want to deposit their material with us uh, or with Westmead County Council. And, you know, that could be the result of, of many of the collections identified within this, but not uh, primarily, I'm not out around Westmead trying to take collections from people. I just want to know where the collections are and to document as much information about them as, as is possible. And then to create um, a list around uh, the material uh, in, in relation to, as I say, location, the, the condition of the material, the, the what format is it in, is it still in, you know, tape format, is it even in an older legacy format, is it recorded digitally, um, is it on a CD, which has now become an older form of, of, of media, even though you know, we were all using CDs in, in terms of of um, the way we preserved oral history up to about ten years ago. So all of that information will will be will be catalogued. All right. So now I want to talk briefly then about you know who are the collectors and and what is a collector. And again, it's an important discussion in relation to this type of a project because in the same way as you know you could ask the same question as who, who's who's a historian. And I, I have a very broad sense of who historians are. And I've also a very broad sense of who, you know, oral historians and oral collectors are, because, you know, um, there are the, the professional, um, you know, well-known types of collectors like the Shana Sulawan, who you see there uh, on your screen, or, or the many, many others who work, let's say, for the Folklore Commission, who are tremendous people. Um, but there are also then individuals who, who, you know, just by sheer interest in culture and their own local heritage, went out with a tape recorder and started recording people. And, you know, I think both have, have equal value. And within this project, we'll be able to identify a range of the collectors. But I wouldn't, wouldn't, ever need, I wouldn't want anybody to dismiss themselves um, just because maybe, for example, they did one tape recording with their grandmother, you know, 10 years ago. Um, that is an important uh, recording. You know, there, there are differences we have to identify in the way in which material is collected and the way in which it, it can be ac accessed, etc. But um, I, I think it's really important that we uh, we have, um, uh, sorry, that, that we have, um, we're very broad in our interpretation of who collectors are. So I'm just saying here, um, it may would accept music and song recordings and collections. Yeah, I have that in the slideshow as well, Geraldine. Yeah, we'll be talking about it man, in a little while as well. So, okay. Um, so again, just remember that 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 uh, the idea of the collectors, anybody can be a collector. Like, well, let's let's talk about the material that's been collected. Let's see what we can do with it. What needs to be done to to help it in any way. Um, but let's be very broad in terms of who are the collectors. Now about the the collections themselves and the collection holders. Uh, so these are the people I'll be looking at and the collections I'll be looking at. Recorded collections of oral heritage and folklore undertaken over uh, many decades since it was possible, I suppose, to record um, voice. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking back really to the beginning of the Folklore Commission, obviously. And then as, you know, technology develops into the 50s and 60s, it becomes possible for people on the ground to undertake their own recordings. So that looks like that brings us into, you know, private collections, you know, um, and public Bodies, you know, since the 80s and 90s, you would have seen, uh, you know, and I wouldn't say a significant increase, but an increase in the in the, in the collection of oral history, even by organisations. Um, and and if there's organisations that have any bodies of oral history collected, I want to meet them. Um, but of course, I think that the majority will be 
will have been undertaken by individuals or at least driven by individuals who really wanted to go and collect history or oral history in their own uh, local community usually usually or maybe the likes of, of, of Jim Dockery there who I was talking to earlier on or yesterday who's done it right across Roscommon you know and um, you know I know I'm not going to speak for, for Jim but has done it over the last decade at least and you know that even outside of the boundaries of Roscommon as well so there's a broad range there of course I've mentioned the professional work of the Folklore Commission commercial collections as well which would be in place in terms of, of, of funded uh, collections of, of memory community collections of, of folk traditions and customs this isn't just you know life stories if it's a recording about folklore folk traditions customs whatever it might be if there's somebody talking about Westmead um, in terms of some form of testimony, then it's relevant. Um, I mentioned about the recording of a grandmother and throughout the audits I've done so far, I've come across some really, really powerful, you know, simple recordings within a family and, you know, the people themselves mightn't think it's oral history, but, but it is uh, really um, important uh, collected memory. And then, of course, the community radio stations within, like Athlone Community Radio, um, I'm hoping to, to meet with them in the coming weeks and to, to see what we can do to identify, you know, the way in which they've recorded memory within their uh, shows and within their documentaries. A few other things to, to talk about before I start um, uh, into the actual material that we've found so far, or, so, or samples of it, or, sorry, uh, examples of it. A um, few quick things to, to just to mention. I do say we're, we're very broad in the way we look at oral history collections, but there are things to consider. So, you know, there would be a... a, a um, an opinion, I suppose, within certainly within academic circles around what oral history is. And, you know, that that definition or understanding would be usually related to, you know, the way in which it's undertaken. And that would usually surround the ethical process involved in the collection of oral history. So that could be, for example, you know, relating to the use of consent forms. Um, the 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 verbal recorded consent at the beginning of a recording it could relate as well to the archival uh, process or the let's say where the material is preserved where it's made available now that is right and of course if we're doing oral history now we need to try and do it in a way that's right in terms of 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 consent and that's ethically sound um but i also feel in in the context of these audits it's it's borne out that if we are too you know dismissive in our definitions of what oral history is versus recorded memory as i say in the slide there then i think we we will lose so much material because we know up until or at least those of us involved in oral history we know that up until really recently um the widespread use of consent forms just wasn't in play and and you know that's perfectly understandable because a lot of the recordings that took place within communities, particularly, were, were amongst people that knew each other intimately and, you know, the, the consent was implied. Now, I don't, I'm not dismissing for a second the importance of the, the of having info, of informed consent and consent forms and all of that. Um, but I think in this project, I want to know about material and let's call it recorded memory that's out there. Let's see where it is. Let's see what we can find out about it. And if there's then things we have to concern ourselves with with regard to the collection, or if there are things we can talk to the, the, the whoever holds the collection about it and, and sort some stuff out, let's do that. But um, let's not leave collections of memory that have so much relevance to us in, in Westmead to, or to the county of Westmead um, because of some issue around um, concerns around the, the technical process that was involved. Um, the reason I've these three icons is 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 in relation to anybody who's done training with me will know I talk about the the, the life, uh, the place, and the person. So you know these are the three broad categories that will come into play in terms of the subjects that are explored in collections. The the individual life testimony of the person recorded, the place that they're talking about, or the places, and then of course uh, the um, the the time associated with their life and what um, happened happened uh, in parallel to all of that and that is a you know that can be said very quickly but there is a world of memory within those three categories and within those three categories will fall the um 
the broader um, subjects that we'll, we'll be hopefully finding within these collections. So just a final few pieces then before I get to, to the collections. Um, the lost tapes, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've touched on it already, but there's no doubt that there are collections out there that people aren't aware of or, um, you know, they, they might be aware of a collection, but not aware of what's within it. I've encountered many tapes, even I remember in Bunkrana, uh, finding hundreds of tapes belonging to a, a priest who had collected over many decades. And, you know, some of them were, were reasonably well described. Others had nothing on them at all um, in terms of the information. So, you know, there's a real challenge with that. But I think it's an exciting challenge if there's a box of tapes that somebody's aware of and you've no idea of to the to the extent of the content in there. Um, I think that's fantastic. You know, let's let's see what we can do about identifying the collection and and over time hopefully we'll be able to work our way through um getting it digitized or um figuring out what's in there. And um, but the main thing is to to identify where they are and to 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 help get it in I suppose a secure enough position uh, as possible. Beyond the captions, okay. Um, what I want to make about this point, and again, I would have introduced this image in training from time to time, is that you know there are gaps in what has been collected. No matter if it's the Folklore Commission, no matter if it's Westmead Libraries, uh, you know whatever has been done, there's always other areas that can be explored. So, what the benefit of this pro project and this audit would be, hopefully, it'll tell us broadly speaking, what types of subjects have been explored uh, in relation to County Westmead over the years. And that will tell us what hasn't been recorded and what dimensions of Westmead life, you know, should be focused on in future oral history projects. And your know, oral history is growing. So the baseline knowledge of what's been collected already um, will, will be of benefit to people who are uh, continuing to collect into the future and the increasing numbers of people, hopefully, that'll be uh, collecting as well. But I, I introduced the photograph there of Mr. Costello and his blind wife because, um, you know, the, the broad kind of ways in which we describe um, aspects of our past can be very deceptive because this is a photograph that's in a public museum and it describes Mr. Costello and his blind wife. It was a, a survey of vernacular um, buildings in West Clare back in the 1930s. And uh, I remember looking at this photograph many, many times in the county museum and thinking, Jesus, wouldn't her name be in it? And so again, the people who I trained in this and this group will know what I'm talking about. But she turned out, uh, Miss the blind wife, as she was described, turns out to have been one of the greatest storytellers ever recorded by the Irish Folklore Commission. Her name was Breed Banny Kushtala, um, and she was uh, Breed Dunn originally from, from Kerry, who married in Kilbaha and was recorded throughout the 30s and 40s by Taiga Maraku. So, you know, I have no doubt that there are, you know, similar people within Westmead, um, but only by identifying the collections, identifying hopefully what's in those collections, can we find the stories of people maybe like, you know, uh, Breedy Kushtala and, uh, and um, I suppose, bring them back out uh, to the community. All right. So just quickly then to say that uh, the, the project output, the primary thing will be the database, which will hopefully, you know, again, as I say, provide comprehensive information about um, the the, the collections and that, of course, as I said, will include where are the collections, what's the current condition, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the details, you know, if it's possible to provide them about, you know, who's the collection holder and how they can be contacted if they're happy to be contacted. Um, and of course, then some broad collection level descriptions of what's in the, 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 the collections of memory. And hopefully, the, you know, there's much more categories than that, of course, but the, the point is that it, it tells us as much as is possible about each collection. Um, and um, that broadly then should open up a foundation of knowledge for the people of Westmead about their, their, their collected oral history and the potential for that in terms of, you know, educational programs in, in terms of, of a cultural understanding is enhanced because now you have information about these collections and for the ones that are available and accessible you take for example you know the work that Nola Callahan is doing and he'll be talking in a little while but about you know military life and and, and the connections with Westmead in particular um I know having worked with the military archives oral history project that that has been made available uh, online and and through the the archives themselves. So 
the knowledge of what's there will enable people, students, historians to go to those places and find them. Um, and, and that hopefully will be the case for Westmead. We'll also be obviously providing a report which will break all that information down uh, and, and um, provide information about each individual collection as well. So there'll be plenty of information um, made available to the public in those different formats to, to hopefully comprehensively show what's been recorded. And maybe in time, I know there might be the potential for, for some form of a publication um, based on the findings of the, of the collection as well, um, but that's for a future. Uh, um, uh, date. So, just to talk through some of the collections that are out there and um, that have been identified, and as I say, we are early in the project, but in terms of uh, Westmead Libraries, and this is just at, at a glance, I'm, I'm sitting down with Paula Dornan in the next couple of weeks to go through in more detail um, the different collections, but Remembering Working Life and the Industries of Westmead is a collection that I'm going to play some material from in a little while. It was undertaken quite recently uh, by Adrian Roach uh, in Westmead and, um, you know, so, some, some wonderful material in there. Again, a funded, supported project by uh, Westmead County Council, um, which is, of course, then followed on and archived. Um, Colin Barracks and me, of course, is Nola Callahan. I'm going to come back to that in a little while, but that's a very much increasing uh, collection. Irish Life and Lore did, did some work within uh, Westmead in the previous uh, decades as well. And then, of course, Kinnegad Story Archive, Westmead and Song and Story. And uh, again, that was a funded project, which I suppose again, might not be technically defined as oral history, but there is memory and there is story uh, within that collection, uh, which immediately brings a, a value to it. So the Westmead libraries, I know um, in a little while, maybe Melanie might say a few words on it, but in terms of of, of taking in collections, uh, that's certainly an opportunity, you know, for, for, for that to happen. I know that deposit uh, sort of processes have been developed. We've worked on it over the last year or so. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure the Westmead Library's sort of um, archive of oral history is going to grow over the coming years as well. And um, but that's up to obviously individuals and groups as to what they want to do with their materials. So the Westmead uh, oral, uh, it, sorry, the Westmead Industrial Heritage uh, Oral History Project, as I said, was undertaken um, in in recent years. I have a piece I want to play uh, from an interview that was undertaken. Um, it, as part of this project. And again, it's just a short piece. It's from a man called, uh, as you can see there, John Joe uh, Quigley uh, from Killaloo near Athlone. And he is, uh, as you can read, the fourth generation to continue uh, boat building within his family. And again, you know, documentation of the memory uh, of those types of traditions and crafts is so, so important because as we, we know all too well, a lot of those trades and occupations, you know, we have seen the tail end or we're seeing the tail end, seeing the tail end of them. So um, I play a piece, it's only about, I think maybe two minutes long, I'm going to play, um, but it's John Joe Quigley just talking about that tradition. My name is John Joe Quigley. I uh, was born in the middle fifties and I grew up in this house of my great grandfathers. Uh, I was educated in the National School in Tupper Clare and later in the Technical School in Athlone where I learned my early carpentry that I used in the boat building later. When I left school uh, I went straight into an apprenticeship of boat building, traditional uh, clinker built uh, wooden boats which were built for the Shannon you know and uh, I had an apprenticeship with Peter Quigley, his distant cousin of mine at Killing Your Point and uh, I spent uh, eight years there with him. You have some lovely photographs there of, I, I, yeah. but maybe just tell me a little bit about who you've got there. And I, I've got here Peter Quigley. He was born in 1807 and uh, he, he lived here all his life in this house and uh, I think there was 10 members in his family. And then he, he, uh, his youngest son was Peter, or uh, sorry, Henry Quigley. He was a boat builder. He lived here and he had eight children. And I mean, it's not a big house as you can see, <laughs> but uh, the, the, um, he spent all his life here. And my father was Thomas Quigley, there was eight in his family. And he lived here and they all lived into the late 80s, 86 to 88. 
So, um, um, what I want to say about that piece, um, not alone the value of it uh, on its own merit, but it opens up that idea of the, the oral tradition, you know, that comes with a recorded piece of memory. Because sometimes, particularly again in academic circles, we see oral history as, you know, the testimony of an individual about their life story. And that, that's perfectly fine. That probably would be the technical definition of oral history. And, and that's, of course, massively valuable. Um, but then we, of course, with oral tradition and inherited memory, we have this opening up into the past that, you know, that, that can only be really reached through that form of of um, of memory. And it, it, it always has, has fascinated me, the ability for us to, through, you know, questioning some person uh, to reach back into maybe two or three generations, um, you know, before they were born it, it, through the tradition that they inherited. So there will be that oral tradition in these collections. But what adds value in the context of what we're looking at is if we have collections, if we have an interview today, you know, on the 19th of August 2022, I can talk to somebody in their 80s and I can unearth tradition that goes back maybe to the early 1900s. Um, or maybe even a little bit earlier, but if, if I have a tape recording that was undertaken with a 90 year old man or woman in 1980, you know, then, of course, the, the ability to reach deeper into our own collective history intensifies because that person recalling and, and speaking in 1980 um, just by, by virtue of their, their, their lifeline can, can, can go back further. So there's, there's great oral history being collected recently. Um, but I think there's so much material in the tapes and the recordings that are around the country. Um, that's really the motivation of these audits to to try and make sure that they're identified and 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 hopefully uh, help in some form with their with their preservation. Of course, the other big collection then we have to consider uh, in any discussion around folklore or oral history is the the National Folklore Collection in UCD. And again, um, hugely. You know, it's hard to describe how important it is and where it sits globally as well in relation to, to folklore collection throughout the world. Um, you know, Ireland would be very, very strong in that context. And, you know, it's testament to the likes of people like Seamus O'Dellarga and Sean O'Sullivan, etc., who started that work back in the 20s and who engaged with people, you know, in places like like Uppsala and Finland and, and other places around the world that were already um, involved in the documentation of national folklore. Um, so, of course, there's relevance to Westmead. I've been up there already for a day and I'll be up there for a few more days. Um, there are hundreds of collections, um, sorry, hundreds of, of items, I should say, in relation to uh, Westmead. I'm going to talk briefly through those, but certainly, you know, I'm sure many of you will, will be aware that in, in recent years, there's been a lot of material made available online through duchas.ie. Um, and of course, if you have not been on it, I would encourage you straight onto it because I think there's 529 entries uh, in relation to Westmead and the school's folklore scheme, um, which is, is fantastic. 50, about 50 schools, uh, Westmead schools, their, their contributions have been transcribed, transcribed and made available on the site. So again, um, you can bring it back down to the local uh, connection in Westmead. And, you know, it's, 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 it's not technically, of course, recorded memory, but of course, it's a relevant body of information. And within the UCD uh, co broader collection of recordings, there is material and I'm working my way through that at the moment. Um, I do want to acknowledge because there's only recently uh, Westmead History and Society or relatively recently that book was published and within it is a really great article uh, or chapter um, by Barbara, Barbara Neeline, who, who's written about some aspects, as you can see here, of some aspects of vernacular culture and oral history in County Westmead. Um, Jim Delaney and his work with Patsy Johnson. So that's looking at the work of, of Jim Delaney, who again was a fantastic collector who did a lot of work in Westmead. Um, you know, and other places, of course, around Roscommon and other worlds as well, but but did fantastic work. And again, a lot of the material is is archived and available on request and on an appointment with um the, the UCD folklore collection. But just as a quotation uh, from Barbara Neeline about Jim Delaney, she says his work was of particular importance because he documented the richness of tradition in the Midlands, that great storehouse that very often goes completely unrecognized. And, and that I think is a really important point because oftentimes when when we look at nationally let's say folklore or oral history we, we tend to, to gravitate immediately maybe to the west and sometimes obviously to the Gaeltacht areas and that's because 
of course, you know, it was an obvious place for the Folklore Commission to concentrate um, throughout the, the 1930s and 40s. But of course, then there are other counties and Westmead is one of them that has tremendous tradition and unique history and heritage in its own right. So Jim Delaney was one of those people in the, you know, the 60s in particular, who, who kind of, um, I suppose, uh, excavated to some degree that material and, and documented an awful lot of it uh, from tellers around uh, County Westmead. So I'd encourage you to read that as a kind of an avenue into to, to, to his understanding. But just to name some of the other collectors who, who I went through all the so far anyway, in relation to Westmead, many of them, I think you probably know some of their names, like, as I mentioned, Jim Delaney, Leo Corduff, um, Barbany Lyon, who's still working, doing great stuff, Tom Munley, the late Tom Munley did work in Westmead, Michael J. Worthy, more recently, Watson Mills, Deirdre Nuttall, and of course, Chris Dorn McCarrick, who's still working in, in the, the folklore collection as well, and, and many, many others. But um, what, I, what I want to, 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 to say about all of that is, I think there's over, I've identified over 300 items in the National Folk Reflection. I have a lot more work to do on it. But some of it is music. Tom only would have recorded a lot of music. But again, there would be discussion, conversation around that. But again, I'm hoping to be able to present that in a format that, that kind of makes it easy enough uh, for... Um, uh, for the public to to then go to the National Folklore Collection and identify what they want more easily uh, in relation to Westmead and uh, ultimately access that. Um, just to have a quick look here, and it might be difficult for you to see some of that, but this is just a, a word cloud relation to uh, relating to some of the, the words that I've identified or teams that I identified within um, relating to Westmead. Um, you know, I'm not going to obviously go through them all, but you can see some of the ones you might expect. But, you know, like faction fighting, you know, the traveling schoolmaster, Adolphus Cook, the yeoman, um, fighting hill, fairy lore, of course, comes up. Funeral fights comes up again. Fighting comes up a bit, it seems. Uh, I don't know what that means about Westmead. Um, but the sucking cow, the will of the wisp, landlords, tinsmiths, um, corpse rising, uh, you know, traditions around marriages, bonfire night. Uh, fishing, poaching, um, the Christmas block, all of these, some of which I, I was able to identify others in terms of, of relating to other counties that I would have worked in, but then some that are, of course, unique then to, to, to Westmead. But there's this world of stuff in there. And as I said, hopefully at the end of this, it'll be more understandable. A um, couple of other points then. Um, I, I've, I'm working with the, the, the Tamament Library um, in, in America, uh, in New York, which has some material relating to Westmead. I'm working with them to try and clarify exactly what uh, the nature of it is, but there are some uh, Westmead immigrants who were interviewed as part of oral history projects out there. Um, and uh, I'm excited to find out a little bit more about those in relation to the exact detail of, of what's in there, but there definitely are uh, some number of people who've been interviewed and it can be surprising, you know, where interviews about Westmead can can turn up um, and that's the point I'm trying to make with that is that you know it's not just collections in Westmead um, but there could be collections in any part of the country where somebody was interviewed let's say in county um, down somebody could be interviewed a, a, a Westmead native you know so I'm looking at other collections and contact them to see is there anything in their bodies of material relating to county Westmead as well so just briefly um the GA Oral History Project, of course, has, I think it's about 13 recordings there of Westmead uh, GA um, former players and, and, and uh, uh, people involved. Um, of course, you know, again, a great collection of material. The, the metadata or the information about it is great. It's available online. Um, so again, that's something that's to be encouraged. There was a book published, Grassroots um, Stories from the Heart of the GA, that he, eight of the Westmead uh, people interviewed were included in that publication, which is a national publication. So again, that material is being used, which is uh, fantastic. So again, another body of memory. Uh, the work of Angus Finnegan and the Westmead Field Names Recording Project. He's already come forward and, uh, you know, um, uh, is working on uh, the, the audio recordings that he did around place names and field names, which of course is hugely important as we know in terms of the pronunciation of local field names. So again, there may be others like that out there. Um, now, um, uh, I haven't too many more slides to go through myself, but I want to just briefly um, bring in Noel O'Callaghan. And before I do, I just want to say that 
I met Noel first through the course uh, that Melanie ran um, for, for Westmead in oral history and like, wow, the way, the way he's taken it on and and the way he's applied the, the you know, whatever he learned there and whatever he knew anyway is, is just fantastic. I know he did a, a talk there uh, during this Heritage Week about the work that he's been doing, but I asked Noel, would he mind just saying a few words about his work? Um, and he kindly accepted. So if Noel, you want to unmute yourself there and, and uh, say a few words about your experience, I, I'd be very grateful. You can just unmute yourself there, Noel, and away you go. Okay. Yeah. Perfect, Noel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose, I, I suppose to just to start off, I, I retired from the Defence Forces uh, in 2017, uh, having done 43 years. So I, I literally joined up in Colin Barracks in Mullingar as a 17 year old from Ballyfermot in Dublin. Uh, you could say I kind of grew with the barracks. Um, mm -hmm. And we came up the line together. So when I returned uh, in, in 2017, it was in the rank of the regimental sergeant major. So I knew everyone and I knew the, the people that had come through the barracks. So fast forward to COVID and, and, and the, that two-year period, there were two things happened. I'm part of a, a, a group, Colin Barracks Regeneration Restoration Committee. Uh, because the barracks is closed and it's been taken over by the Land Development Agency. Um, so we produced a document, a vision statement. But it struck me that regardless of if they take on everything that we, we've recommended, the barracks will be gone as we know it. Um, more importantly though, during COVID, I seem to be forever attending the funerals of retired uh, soldiers. Uh, not, of, not from COVID, but from age and illness. So I, I, it was a concern of mine. And then I, I became aware of the oral history course, which has been facilitated by uh, Melanie, the historian for Westmead County Council, and uh, funded by uh, Creative Ireland. And I conducted that course uh, with yourself, Tomas, under your, your guidance, Tomas. So you basically gave us the kind of the tools to go and um, to go out and and kind of find the guys and, and see what they talk. And I suppose there were two things about this. One was that uh, for whatever reason, soldiers are, are very, uh, very rel reluctant to talk about their history. And uh, it came up during a, a, a number of the oral histories. Uh, but the other thing was, I, because of the age and illness of some of them, I actually found myself uh, afraid to go out because what I was afraid of is if I made a mess of an interview with Melanie McQuaid, uh, I could go back and say, listen, I, I messed up, can we do it again? The problem for me was that as a number of my ex-comrades would be have age and illness issues that I couldn't go back to. So I kind of really had to uh, plan how I was going to get myself started. And really what I did was I chose my, for my first uh, interviewee, my predecessor as, in, as the Sergeant Major. I knew him well, he trained me as a recruit and I knew him throughout my 43 years and after even he retired and, and we went out. It's hugely important to capture oral histories and uh, and the histories and, and our heritage because um, in our rush to be Europeans it's important to remember that we get our customs and traditions our background is our heritage is we are Irish and we need to always remember that so that was my driving force and uh, and I, uh, I went um, the training was hugely important simple things like uh, yeah, and you mentioned them there about the, the uh, consent forms. Now, I'm actually working with both with two groups, Melanie and Westmead uh, Heritage, but also the Defence Forces Military Archives based in Cattlebrewer Barracks in Dublin uh, under the command of uh, Commandant Daniel O'Lattis and 
archivist and project manager, Noel Grotter, who are based there. So when I go to, with 10 oral histories to Westmead Libraries, I go down on the train to Dublin to Cattleborough Barracks and I hand over the same material to them. Um, what's interesting is I find uh, when the guys are, when, as their stories unfold, some of them, you can see them drifting back in time. Uh, depending on what the circumstance is, you, you can, uh, uh, some of them might get emotional uh, or, or indeed upset. And one of the points you made in your in your in the course, Thomas, was was to give them their time, not to jump in and and uh, to, to give them their space and let them move on. Uh, and and they do most of the time. Now and again, uh, you might have to give a prompt or to bring them back in. And once you do, and and they come back on on track, then off they go again. None of them taught you had anything to say. Uh, but the, the smallest recording has been an hour and a half. Some of them go up to four hours. Um, and what's interesting too is the comparisons of the, the 16 year old guy that cycled from Offaly to Athlone to join the army and, and was in the Congo within months uh, fighting the Battle of the Tunnel, age 16, uh, washing and shaving from a, a uh, wheelbarrow full of water because there was no water. And yet we, we move on to Chad and to Liberia in the, in the missions in the last couple of years where because of water, there was a 30 second shower. So the issues, a lot of the issues are the same. The caliber of the soldier is the same. The, the belligerence and the hostile environments uh, are the same. The equipment has changed, it's got better. But a lot of the issues are very similar, dating back from the guy that joined in 61 to the guy that joined in uh, maybe 20 years ago. Hmm. So um, uh, for, for the guys themselves, once they, sorry, I found myself, I, I do have to, I do find, because maybe it's the military background, I do pl plan very much the interview. So I would make an initial contact with uh, ex-corporal Tomas McCormick and uh, I would get details of him. I mean, tic tac a few times before the actual interview. Uh, and then when they, when they do present, and I, sorry, I would also take photographs. I would actually encourage photographs. Uh, whether it be one or 101, I'll take every one of them and I, and I put them forward because I make the point that in 50 years time, <clears throat> their grandchildren or great-grandchildren will be listening to their voice talking about the camel spiders in Chad or the, uh, the insects that, that bit you in Liberia that, that formed maggots under your skin uh, and had to be lanced initially by medics, but now soldiers just do it themselves because you have to go quickly. So they're listening to this 50 years now, having maybe no... In, uh, insight into the defence forces and then they're looking at pictures and they might say God he mentioned he was in he, he was on a, a guard of honour for uh, Pope John when he visited Ireland and look that must be the picture there so this is the kind of stuff I'm, I'm trying to capture Noel thanks a million that, that's really brilliant and, and I was I was just delighted to be hearing you because again I know from when you started it and how much you've achieved I think it's 39 is that right you've, you have 39 interviews you've done Noel is that right or is it up to 40? Yeah, I'm up to 40 now but I just haven't presented some of them and, and I've I've 10 now planned uh, at the moment so I just and of course you have to wait for the availability of the people themselves uh, sure. depending on if they're working if they're retired uh, what brought home to me actually just to make this point uh, and without sounding too morbid, two of my ex-comrades, uh, one a senior officer and one a senior NCO, I was to conduct their oral history. And uh, they died very close to each other within a time frame. But both of them uh, were, were one week from when I was to record them. And again, it, it brought home to me how important it is, 
how uh, how quick time can fly, and 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 the intro to our vision statement uh, that the the barracks committee produced. Uh, I made the point that the clock in Colin Barracks is ticking, and it, so too is it's ticking not just for the future of the barracks, but for the the soldiers and the veterans that have uh, have come through those walls. Well, very well said, Noel, and thanks a million for that. I appreciate you uh, 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 doing that for us. Um, God, it's a real, I can see it's a real pure motivation for you. And you made a very important point about, let's say, 50 years from now. I, I think what's important in relation to this particular audit is that, you know, if, if there are probably material, our grandmother's voices and grandfather's voices that are there on tapes that, that haven't even been listened to since they were recorded. So again, that's part of the motivation for this project is, is to bring together what has been already recorded with what's ongoing, like the work that you're doing. And the other point then as well is that you're a man, as you say, from Dublin originally, you know, collecting memories now that, that relate in and out of Westmead and in and out of, of Colin Barracks, etc. Um, there's other projects ongoing. I think Rita Delaney is there from, from the, the Garda uh, Oral History project which I'm delighted to be working on as well and you know that's an ongoing project and will no doubt intersect with, with Westmead from from either people RD from Westmead or guards who worked in Westmead so there, there's 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 many projects outside of Westmead that will relate to it um so we'll be watching for all those as well so look I'll go back to the presentation and we'll be finished soon enough and give a chance for people to to ask questions um if they want so just a few more uh, I want to mention and then we'll uh, We'll be we'll be uh, wrapping up. Um, so just going back to that, and I'd open out the presentation again. So yeah, so one of the other things I wanted to mention was the Dunashi um memory project, which again is just a brilliant project that um was undertaken last November uh, at the Dunashi Heritage uh, Park. And there were two main interviews done. You can see the photographs there. Up on top, you've got Nancy and Pat Claffey and their granddaughter, Hannah Higgins. And then on the bottom, you have young Tom, uh, who is the, the grandson of Liam Handy, uh, who's 80 years of age. Uh, and, and in those recordings, which were, were videoed, um, there's fantastic reflection first on COVID um, and the experience of COVID, which of course we sometimes forget that, you know, oral history can be testimony of quite recent events and sometimes great oral history is done where you're actually talking about what's happening around you at the moment and obviously oral history, or COVID was, was a really significant experience for the country. Um, but then there was obviously more reflection as well on, you know, the experiences of the likes of of of, uh, of Liam Handy and, and Nancy and Pat Claffey about their lives. But what I love about it is you can see it right there in the image is the intergenerational connection. And that's, I think, one has to be one of the great motivations is both for families to, to be connected between the generations, but, but societally as well, that the bodies of material that we collect and the bodies that we hopefully identify in this audit have to be the foundation for an increased connection between younger and older people um, and a better understanding of the value of oral history and memory and, and, and older people ultimately as well of, as bearers of that uh, tradition and story. So it was a really positive project. Um, it's available online. You can go onto the Dunashi website. It was supported by by um, the Westmead um, Heritage Officer and County Council as well and Creative Ireland. Um, so you can listen through to, to some of those uh, videos, great public feedback. It's all there. Um, that was sent to me. This will all be included in the report. But really, really positive, uh, positive work that was done. Um, I should have had this slide earlier, but it's just an image from the folklore collection of Jim Delaney down in, uh, I think it's uh, Kilimanehan down in in uh, or in Westmead uh, at Saint Minahan as well. Um, so it, it's it's just part of the work that was undertaken uh, by by. Um, by Jim Delaney. Now, just two other uh, archives that I've identified some material, uh, Geraldine Green, who I think I'm presuming it's Geraldine from Clare, if it is, how are you Geraldine? Um, but uh, the Irish Traditional Music Archive of, of course has material that relates uh, to Westmead and to most of the country. And then the National Museum of Ireland actually has some good uh, recordings as well. Um, they're shorter pieces, but they're on uh, elements of material folklore um, and material culture within the museum and there is some stuff in there from Westmead that I'll be tracking 
and down as well. Now, an un, not an unusual collection, but a collection I work quite intensively on because I, I've worked for a number of years with the military archives up in Dublin and uh, in developing the oral history project up there. And then there were some legacy material that came in. And the biggest collection was the Unshin MacOwen collection, um, which was 102 recordings that were the basis of Unshin's work on the... Um, three publications, the, the IRA and the Twilight Years, Survivors, and another book on Harry White. So I, I had the pleasure of, of over two years of listening back to every single one of those tapes and uh, creating reports on them, et cetera. And there is plenty of reference to and connections to Westmead. Um, James McCormack, you know, who, who with, with, uh, with, um, with Paddy Barnes was, was executed, of course, as we know, in our Peter Barnes, I should say, in 1940 over in England after the Coventry bombing, um, what, what is referred to throughout, um, not in great detail, but is referred to throughout because some of the people interviewed were doing contemporaries of him. Um, Paddy Dermody, again, another IRA uh, volunteer from Castle Pollard, comes up. Mara Comerford and her connections to Westmead um, through the, the Daisies family uh, is, is, is in there. Con Casey, again, another Republican, but his mother was Mary Malavin from Castletown, Gehigan, and again, he talks about her and her background. So there are these sort of um, I suppose, not tangential, but sort of sideways connections into Westmead. Seamus and Tomás and Whelan, of course, from Meaden, very significant figures politically. Um, they, 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 Tomás is actually interviewed and both of them come up. Larry Ginell, who was described once, I think I told Melanie this, Larry Ginell uh, was introduced down in my native county, Clare, in O'Callaghan's Mills, where my father came from. And uh, the man who introduced him, uh, was a bit excitable and he introduced Larry Ginnell as the man who fought and died for Ireland. So that was a, a, a fairly uh, powerful way of introducing somebody. But anyway, Walter Mitchell, again, a really interesting interviewee, uh, talked about his mother, Dorothy Lowe, from Westmead as well. So within that collection, which again has been processed and and, and there, there's availability there uh, through the military archives, there is plenty of material relating to County Westmead as well. And I'm sure there's many, many more collections uh, there. So just to finish up from me um, in terms of, of making contact. This this is recorded, obviously, so that will be made available as well. Um, but anybody can contact me directly. My contact details are there. I'm not that difficult to find anyway. If you wanted to just put my name into Google and you'll, you'll find me fairly quickly. But certainly through um, my phone number there or my email, you'll, you'll, you'll find it very easy to contact me and I'll come straight back to you or at least as soon as I can. Um, of course, if you want to contact Melanie directly, there's no problem in Smead County Council. But in terms of the project, I'm happy to receive direct contact. If you have any questions, um, um, you know, you might have some idea there may be a collection and you want to just clarify, by all means, just please make contact and I'd be happy to talk to you. I'll also be able to send you out uh, this form which we have created uh, for the project as well. Um, so just give me a second. Oh, I can't get into that now. But anyway, there's a form I can send out which makes it quite easy to give information on the project uh, that you might have. So look, um, I might just I'll read just to see uh, there's a message coming in from Geraldine Check Community Time Machine Project Online interviews some teenagers and during the pandemic a friend of my coordinated oh excellent okay I'll check that Geraldine thanks a million it is you from Claire very good Geraldine I thought it was you all right great to great to um to, great to hear from you and and uh, I hope all is good so listen um I might hand you back to Melanie for a few minutes but obviously if anyone has any questions I'd be happy to to hopefully try and answer them Second, we're not hearing you. I think you need to switch to the to the PC again, maybe. Can you hear me now? Uh, is that well, you, is it? Yeah. Hi, yeah, Jim. What, you go ahead there while Melanie's yeah, what, I'm just wondering, what about video? Oh, absolutely. Video is is, is included. Um, I mean... Old, old funerals, for instance, I know. Um, we got a few of the old IRA funerals back in the 80s. 60s. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And, and the, the, the um, oration. Oh, wow. Oh, that'd be um, fantastic, yeah. You know, there may be, it's a, um, you see, there could be a lot of, of private collections. Mm. Uh, for instance, FOSS projects and all FOSS yeah. projects. Yeah. Now, people doing books um, that may have done recordings 
like like Angus Finnegan there was on the the history or the place names. Sorry, field names. Yeah. Uh, I know of a woman that was doing an MA in Minute and did about 12 recordings. And while uh, six of them were of no use in that they were very family orientated and that there were three or four of them excellent. You know, so they are the, but I think people need need to be aware of where there are likely to be recordings. Yeah, no, it's and, really... and as I say, maybe some photographers. You know, I don't know. Maybe they might have been doing, as they say, video recording of stuff that could could have a good interest. Or, um, as they say, uh, a 1980 FOSS project yeah. uh, we got, you know, off a lad. And uh, obviously, I mean, like, they're dead. Even, uh, you know, a lot of the people in that would be dead in that, you know? Yeah, it's a really good point because I've come across the... That, that seemed to be, like encouraged throughout the country uh, Jim the FOSS yeah. work in the 1980s because I've seen it in Donegal and in yeah. here and yeah. places the, the difficulty is that unless somebody took it on themselves to kind of preserve it it seems that a lot of it wasn't handled the guy, you know. the, the guy I got it off had them left in the attic I'd say I don't know what 30 years maybe he just had yeah. them left in the box and he said I don't know if I can even find them yeah there you and are he came so, back about a week later with them and uh, they are on the old tapes is that tape and um, you know the excellent. Are there any? I'm just thinking aloud. I know. Are there any plans for we we'll say a repository for stuff in Westmead, or any plans to enhance recordings? You know, did you tidy up and say some of them 1980 recordings? Or yeah, that? I, I'll hand you back to, to, to Melody, but I do know yeah. that certainly in terms of as a repository, I know that the intention is to try and take in, not or to willing to take in material. I know that there would also, I'm sure, be a desire to, to help digitize. I know that's very expensive, yeah. but it can be done. And, and, and I'm sure if it's possible, it'll be done over time. But maybe like, there, want to come there, in there, are, there are people out there that are getting old and nobody in the family is interested in the stuff. Yeah. And they want they don't want it to get lost. Of course. And they, yeah. they don't want somebody to take it. Yeah. Uh, the stuff like that slowly, you know, comes through every now and then as well. I agree. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Melanie, do you want to come in there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, to say, yeah, I mean, the library will accept material and um, they'll look for a form to be filled in um, and certain, certain criteria before they can accept it. But there is a procedure there and they will accept um material for sure yeah in terms of future recordings or future projects i suppose that depends on funding down the line but um mm. there is certainly an interest in doing it if we can yeah excellent so um, could i